Hi, I'm Lindsay with Valentium, and I'm talking with medtech industry leaders on how they change lives for a better world. The inventions and technologies are fascinating, and so are the people who work with them. There was a period of time where I realized fundamentally my job was to go hang out with really smart people that are saving lives and then do work that would help them save more lives. I got into the business to save lives, and it is incredibly motivating to work with people who are in that same business, saving or improving lives. What better industry than where I get to wake up every day and just save people's lives? These are extraordinary people doing extraordinary work, and this is The Leading Difference. Hello, and welcome to The Leading Difference podcast. I'm your host, Lindsay, and I am excited to introduce you to my guest today, Joe Landolina. Joe is the co-founder and CEO of Chrysalon, a Brooklyn-based biotech company developing and manufacturing a plant-based gel technology that stops bleeding in seconds. The revolutionary technology, which was created by Joe, recently received its first FDA clearance in human use. Well, welcome, Joe. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to talk with you. Definitely, Lindsay. Thank you so much for having me on. Of course. I would love if you don't mind by just starting by telling us a little bit about yourself and your background and how you ended up in med tech. Sure. So I have a bit of a unique story coming into med tech because I got a really early start. Uh, but to start from the basics, I'm a chemical engineer by training. I, I did both my undergrad and my graduate work at NYU in New York. I'm a New Yorker, uh, born and raised. And my grandfather was a Hoffman LaRoche executive that in retirement started a vineyard. And uh, he also learned lab safety in the 60s. And so that meant the day I learned how to walk, I was taken into a chemistry lab at my grandfather and told, mix some things together, don't kill yourself, kid. And so from a very early age, I, I got an intro into lab research. And, and so that led to me inventing the technology that Cresselon was based on at the age of 17 uh, when I was a freshman at NYU. And over the last 13 years, I've taken that passion and, and, and that invention and turned it into what Cresselon is today, which is a, a biotech company that uh, has sold our products in 30 countries outside of the U.S. And uh, we, we do all of our manufacturing and, and are headquartered here in Brooklyn, New York. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Well, first of all, <laughs> the fact that you started off in a lab and were just kind of told, go, have fun. Okay, so what are some of your first memories of experimentation? So I'm not sure if I can tell all of the first memories on a podcast as upstanding as this one. Uh, but what I can say is that my, my first several experiments created such fear and anger in my parents uh, that they cut me a deal. And the deal was I, I had to go learn how to do lab research the right way anywhere, please, quickly. And, and so... The end result of that was at the age of 13 or 14 years old, I did a summer research program at Columbia University in tissue engineering. And that program really opened my eyes up to the field of med tech, because at that time, I had a simple worldview where career paths were either doctor, lawyer, accountant, and, and so on. And so realizing that there were so many other shades of possibility within this industry was something that, that I, I realized thankfully at that age. And it, it started this path of really falling in love with this type of research. And I, I dove headfirst into it. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like in general that you've had a passion for basically what you're doing now from a very young age. So how did Columbia help you narrow down this passion into some more specific area of focus? Definitely. And so let me talk a bit specifically about what I was working on at Columbia. Because it, there was a lab there that was using plant-based scaffolding, uh, meaning polymers that come from plant-based materials to grow stem cells that come out of a human patient and have them mm. differentiated into a target tissue. And this lab was working specifically on chondrocytes or cartilage. And, and so it was just amazing for me to see this material taken completely from nature that, that was able to be repurposed to take a patient's own stem cells and turn them back into cartilage, potentially be put back into that same patient. And so it set me down this path where at the time I only had access to the internet was good for a lot of things, but not really finding information yet at that point. And so if you wanted to learn, you had to go to a library, you had to, whether it was a public library or university library, 
And so I surrounded myself with Eastern medicine books and, and books that looked at how pharmaceuticals are derived from nature around us. Because uh, the one thing that I had, I grew up on a vineyard. And, and so I was able to grow anything or collect anything that, that I wanted to. And, and so I had a real interest in finding solutions to the experiments that I was trying to run in nature. And, and I, I got fairly good at identifying these sources of, of material because, again, no one would sell a winery lab or, or a 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 year old reagents <laughs> to do these types of experiments. Mm -hmm. so <laughs> I had to get creative. And, and, and so that was really my entry point into that. And, and Columbia opened my eyes that that was being done at, at the highest levels. Wow. OK, so nature based solutions. And as you have continued to go down this path and then, of course, develop your company and your products, can you tell me a little bit about the origin story of the company? Because, gosh, doing this at 17 years old, that must have been a remarkable breakthrough. So I'd love to hear more about that. Sure. Uh, so to start with, I was running this experiment in the winery lab where I was trying to make a plant-based scaffold to effectively replicate some of the stuff that I, that I had seen at Columbia. And that experiment went terribly uh, because instead of having a multi-million dollar university funded lab, I, I had a, a winery lab, which you can interpret that as effectively a, a glorified kitchen counter with a bunch of equipment that was, quote, borrowed from Roche in the late 70s when my grandfather retired. <laughs> uh, and so... I wasn't very fancy by any means. And so I didn't get the result that I wanted. But what mm. I did get was this material that was a mess that came out of algae that would form a gel that would simply stick to skin and wouldn't let go until you wanted it to. And, and I mm. had this idea, which was, what if you could take a material like that, inject it into a bullet wound, and at least plug up that bullet wound from bleeding so you can get a patient and move from point A to point B without them bleeding out. And at around the same time, as a freshman, this was my first week of school. There was a poster in the engineering quad at NYU that said, best business plan idea, $75,000 top prize. And what Ooh. really drew my eye was that they would give free MBA classes to anyone who got into the quarterfinals. And I, I thought, you know what? There's no way I win, but I wanted to be a doctor. And I, I was an engineer's engineer, and I, I was really looking for things that would round me out on my resume. And I, I thought that this stuff isn't going to work, and it's not going to become a company, but I may as well join this competition. And Worst case scenario, maybe I can talk my way into getting some free business classes and <laughs> get me an internship over the summer. And so I met my co-founder, Isaac, who was a, a student at, at the business school at NYU at the time. And we entered the competition and we ended up taking first place at the engineering school and second place at the business school where he was at. And, and the rest was history. Wow. Oh, my word. Well, congratulations. That's a fantastic origin story. <laughs> And I love the fact that you just went into it with this mindset of even if we don't necessarily win, we're still going to see the benefits from this other education. And I think that's so important to have uh, a lot of cross experiences that eventually help lead into the success. And sometimes you don't see how they all interrelate, but eventually they do. I love that that's how you approach it. What a great mindset. Thank you. Yeah. Well, so, okay, how many years have you been in business? 13 years later. 13 years later, okay. So 13 years later, and you have now gone through several rounds of funding. And so I'm curious how that process has gone for you, because that's a whole other kind of learning curve as well. How has that been for you? So we've been very unorthodox in a number of ways here at Cresselon. And the way that we raised funding was, was no exception to that rule. Uh, and so we've done over $100 million in funding to date across several rounds of funding. Our first round was in 2013. So our seed round was raised from angel investors, high net worth individuals that, that read about us in social media. Uh, we were lucky yeah. in those early years, we had a lot of press coverage, uh, both because of my age and really just because uh, this technology is unlike anything else that I've seen in that you can, in a 20 second video, understand exactly what it does and what the value is. And we had this video of a steak that I cut and we pump blood through it and it's this massive bleed. You put the product on it, it stopped instantly. And, and wow. that video had over 140 million views on it all in all. Yeah. And so we got a lot of attention in the beginning there. Uh, but then those investors that we brought in to raise a couple million dollars in our seed round ended up reinvesting time in and time again, just all the way through the, the company's history. Uh, and so those same investors, along with some other investors that, that we collected along the way, 
ended up being the bulk of the funding that, that we brought in. And that's incredibly rare in this industry, mm. especially in biotech, um, where mm. there, there are usually different VC funds that come in at each stage. And it's not like we don't have venture investing or investment here at Cresselon, uh, but primarily our largest investors and, and the average investor is, is a private individual. And that's very rare for this type of funding, but it's allowed us to build a cohort of investors that primarily are end users. We have a number of surgeons and doctors uh, and veterinarians who have used the product and who were very vocal in helping us design the product uh, in the very beginning. And, and it allowed for uh, this healthy conversation where if there's an investor who has money behind something, they're not going to pull their punches when they tell us what they like and then more importantly, what they don't like about the product. And it allowed us to get really raw, involved feedback from day one effectively. Yeah, which is so important. And what an interesting funding experience you've had. Like you said, it's definitely unique. Now, looking back over the last 13 years, what has been one of the biggest challenges in either starting or building the company? What has been either unexpected or the largest obstacle to overcome so far? So I think that the biggest obstacle by far has been the middle phase of the business. And, and so when I say the middle phase, from the end of 2015 until uh, the end of 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so if we look at the business in sort of five-year packets of time, from 2010, which is when we founded the company and had the idea, to 2015, we were building a product that worked. And so at the end of 2015, we had Vetagel. We knew Vetagel would work and we were able to manufacture it. But we realized that the market demand far exceeded our ability to manufacture. And in fact, we were too reliant on third parties. And so in 2015, the goal was to effectively outsource everything that we could. And unfortunately, mm. when you make a highly novel product like this, we were finding that we were unable to find partners that could outsource. So in fact, there was not a single manufacturer that could manufacture Vetagel. We had to do everything ourselves. Uh, but there weren't even labs that could do the testing that we needed. And so we were wow. getting false positives and false negatives. And so in 2015, we were ready to launch. I made one of the hardest decisions that, that I ever had to make. So I pulled the plug on the whole thing. I, I went back to our investors and told them, look, if we can't do this the right way, if we can't ensure the safety of our product, we're not launching. And we raised 10 times the amount of money uh, that, that we raised up to that point uh, just to build brick and mortar manufacturing. We brought in individuals who had built quality labs and, and done this at scale for large vaccine manufacturers. And, and Cresselon at that point became the very first or, or the very only sterile manufacturer in the five boroughs of New York, something that we're proud of, but it took us five years. And, and that was a very hard, onerous time where, frankly, we didn't know if, if it was perfectly possible or completely possible to do what we needed to do. And so the entire time we were working on perfecting, on validating, uh, on standing up this factory where we had to design all of the equipment from scratch. Our product is like the consistency of hummus. So mm. it's incredibly viscous. And there are lots of machines and manufacturers that make vaccines and lots of machines and manufacturers that make hummus, but no one dumb enough to do it together. And so oh. we were lucky enough to be the first and we had to figure out a way to get it done. And so we had to design clean rooms. We were one of the first production clean rooms that had to be made in New York City under New York building code. So oh. we had to even custom design things like sprinkler heads to comply with FDNY regulations, but also maintain the sterility of our clean rooms. Yeah. And so it was literally nuts to bolts. Like every test that's run on a syringe today was designed by a Crestlon employee. Uh, and something we're proud of, but it, it was hard. We were going uh, effectively month to month where we couldn't sell, we couldn't make revenue until mm. we got all of these pieces put together. I mean, obviously when, when you're doe-eyed and naive, you think it's an 18 month process to stand up a factory, but it, it took all of five years and, and, and it culminated with launching in the very best time to launch a new product to a direct customer in an operating room, which is at the height of the COVID pandemic in October of 2020. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. All those years of just waiting and planning and executing, but not, not quite being there. Oh my word, your patience and your stress good for you to have gotten through that. I would love to hear about what you consider your biggest win, but I recently read something that I wonder if we'll be on the same page here with that. But tell me what your biggest win is so far to date. So frankly, Crystalon's mission is saving li lives. And yeah. the biggest win still to this date, right, is saving our first animal life. 
right? Mm. You, um, my guess is that you're going to mention that the recent FDA approval for humans. But what I tell my team is it's not about the paperwork. It's not about the regulation. And that's an amazing accomplishment that, that I, I don't want to minimize by any means. Yeah. But it's about what we do for our patients and what we do for our clinicians. And yeah. so, you know, for me, I, I'm an engineer by training. And, and so that means I'm a natural pessimist. And, uh, and so I always look for flaws in products because I, I like to fix flaws. And the thing that you can't argue with is when you take a patient that would have not survived a procedure uh, and translate that into a successful outcome. Uh, and uh, we've now done that over 45,000 times on the Vetagel product line. And what I'll say is that excitement doesn't diminish. And, mm. and we're now ever closer to being able to do it for the first time in a human patient. And that's something we're looking forward to. We still have some, some ways to go before we can achieve that. Yeah. First of all, that's incredible how many lives you've already impacted through what you're doing. And I love your mission statement. I think you're so right to get back to the heart of it. But also, I do want to say congratulations for the FDA approval, because I know that was no easy feat. That's really exciting that you're there now, too. So on both ends, lots of lives being saved. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. It, it, it was a journey and a half to, to get to that point. It takes a lot, especially for the first time on, on a new technology to, to get it through. But um, I can take no credit for it. It was all my team. And they were the ones who put in the, the countless hours and, and, and overnight uh, to, to get it done. But from now, that means we can, we can start growing. Yeah, absolutely. Is there any specific instance or memory that stands out to you as reinforcing the idea that you were in the right place at the right time. Like, this is your field, what you're doing, your specific path. Did you have a moment that was just like this affirmation of, yes, I'm in the right place? I'd say that's a really good question. What I'll say is that we've been very lucky throughout the, the entire journey. I think that the silver bullet that allowed us to stand up our factory was something that was only invented itself in the same year that we implemented it. Meaning that if we had gotten there even a year earlier, after developing the technology, the thing that allowed us to solve our problems wouldn't have been there. And to get it back to, uh, to what I was mentioning earlier, I think that there are definitely cases where surgeons that we've just trained have a case come in that day, where on a Monday, we teach them about the product. And on Tuesday morning, they have a dog that's been hit by a car that, that would have been unsavable a couple of days before without our product. And, and there, there are countless cases like that, that we hear about. And it just shows that the world keeps turning, whether or not our products are out there. But the fact that we can be there and make a difference and, and truly save lives is something that, that just is validation enough. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Speaking about being able to use this product with animals, I noticed on LinkedIn that you seem very passionate about animals and especially shared some really heartwarming rescue stories and whatnot. So I have to ask, have you always loved animals? Is this always been a passion of yours? So I grew up on a vineyard with a bunch of property, and I always joked that my parents had a menagerie at home. And so we <laughs> always had everything from dogs and cats to llamas and alpacas and ducks. And they're <laughs> interesting animals going around. And, and, and so I've always been a lover of animals. It's hard living in Brooklyn now. My wife and I recently took a plunge. Last year, we adopted a German Shepherd puppy who very quickly grew to 85 pounds. Uh -huh. <laughs> so she keeps me fit. We, we do 10 miles a day together. And so, oh. <laughs> uh, so, she, so she's adapted well to the Brooklyn lifestyle. But it, it's, it's definitely nice to be able to do that in the city because I went for years without having a pet of my own. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and dogs are just such great companions. It's hard to not fall in love with them. <laughs> so what's next for you and for your company? And what are you excited about coming up? So on the back of this FDA clearance of, of our technology, what's next is translating that into our first human life save. And there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. We still have to scale everything up and kind of get ready for that launch to do it the right way. But it, it's coming. It's scheduled for next year. And it's something that, that we're looking forward to because it just allows us to extend and expand our mission beyond what we've already been doing. And then mm -hmm. on the Vetagel front, we've been seeing really amazing results in indications that, frankly, when I came into this market, I, I never thought that we would be doing surgery. And so we're, Vetagel is being used today in, in brain surgery, is being used in spine surgery to help dogs uh, that 
were paralyzed that now can walk again because their surgery time is short enough uh, that that they're no longer at risk of of going under that procedure. The, the really amazing things that are coming out of that market uh, that we've been working with commercial partners to make sure that we're able to get that in the hands of any vet that that is able to use better gel or we're willing to use better gel. And then, so a lot of growth is ahead of us, and and it, it's just trying to put our heads down and and, and come back to mission, which is, is making sure that we can save lives. Yeah, I love that. So is the plan to continue for both animals and now because you'll have the opportunity to test with humans as well. So is the goal to always have both things going simultaneously? Definitely. Uh, and because we're in the human market, it doesn't mean that animal becomes an afterthought in, yeah. in any way. And so our team in animal health, we have a direct sales force here in the U.S. The, the partners mm-hmm. that we have abroad are, are still staying. And, and so we're still growing those teams pretty substantially. It just means that uh, for better or for worse, we have a lot of hiring to do. We have something like 45 open positions right now as we start to beef up the human commercial side of our business. Wow. Well, that's exciting. So anyone listening could potentially go to your website and learn more about working with y'all. Exactly. We have a careers page on Cressalon.com. And if anyone interested, checks that out. We, we have a number of roles open for people who are interested and, and uh, willing to join our team. Awesome. So one thing that I noticed also on LinkedIn was I saw a couple of different posts about various speaking or resources that you seem very passionate about helping the next generation of professionals in the field to level up their skills, feel comfortable, gain the experience and the knowledge. Would you want to speak anything to that and in terms of your interest in in helping the next generation? I I really appreciated seeing that. Definitely. I I think that, and and, and I'm not the only one by far that's doing this, but it's just founder resources are tricky because there's a level of healthy competition uh, that happens in startups. And so something that's been very near and dear to my heart is just talking openly about sharing of, of resources, talking openly about mental health challenges that the founders go through and being there for the communities that I'm a part of. And, and that, that may mean the New York community, that may mean the NYU community, or, or that may just be the larger entrepreneurship community as a whole. Uh, but in my opinion, this only works if the community comes together and supports one another. And uh, I, I think that you know, I've gone through this journey and uh, there were resources that I had uh, that were amazing and there were resources that I didn't have. And, and what I'm trying to do is, is if there are entrepreneurs out there that, that don't have the same resources that I did have or, or that are looking for something that, that I also couldn't find, if I can be a little part in helping alleviate something, that, then I'm all for it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I love that. Thank you for paying it forward. I think that's really important and it's, very encouraging to continue to see people speak out about various struggles and obstacles. And when you're real and honest and transparent with those kinds of things, you can really help somebody else who might be going through similar challenges. So thank you. I appreciate what you're doing. Definitely. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. And in fact, I have much younger siblings. So my parents, when when I was in high school, wanted to try for a daughter and ended up getting triplets, two boys and a girl. And one of the triplets who turned 18 last week has just founded his first company. And so it's it's nice to see it run in the family. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Congratulations. (laughs) That's pretty cool. All right. Well, pivoting and just for fun. Imagine someone were to offer you a million dollars to teach a masterclass on anything you want. It can be in your field or industry, but it doesn't have to be. What would you choose to teach and why? That, that, I think negotiation would be what I talk about because it leans into entrepreneurship, right? And what I find is both in young entrepreneurs and in candidates that come to work for us or members of my team or even myself, People don't realize that the way to affect change, whether it's in, in their personal lives, in, in their work, or as they're starting a company, it all comes down to how you position it and what you ask for. And, and, and so I think that it, it's something that people realize maybe too late on average, that if you want something, all you have to do is ask for it. And one of the mm-hmm. best learnings that I had early on was that the beauty of New York is that there are so many resources just around us and at our fingertips. And if you want something, most people, their tendency is to say, I'm going to keep that hidden and I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell anyone else that I want this thing. Mm. But the worst you can get is no. 
And and if you ask enough people, odds are you'll find someone who will say yes uh, at, at the <laughs> end of the day, right? And that's how we got our first lab space. That's how we got our first checks. That's how we um, started putting the pieces together to build the business. And and so understanding how to do that is is just such a great launch pad. And uh, maybe I'm not the best professor uh, or teacher of that in myself, but it, it's been a skill set that I find has helped me greatly and that people uh, on average don't seem to realize uh, that, that it's a possibility at pretty much in any circumstance. Yes. Great, great answer. And I would definitely attend that masterclass. I'm really passionate about this topic too. I think there's so much hidden power in just asking. And like you said, the worst someone can say no. And a lot of times that no is not yet. So if you've got a great idea, if you have something you need or want, and you do put it out there, there are so many people that are willing to help. So yeah, I love that. <laughs> What's one thing that you wish to be remembered for after you leave this world? I, I think that I, I feel bad giving the same answer, but it, it's true. So, I, so I'm going to say it again, but it's just, if there is one patient that had their life or had a family member affected because of technology that we put out, that's enough. And so the way that I view what we do, right, I, I want to have made a difference in someone's life. I, I want to have made a product that swings the needle in, in, in the direction of good rather than worse. Yeah. And just think of all of those animals already. <laughs> that alone to me is very cool as well. And this is just the beginning. So yeah, that's exciting. And Final question. What is one thing that makes you smile every time you see or think about it? Uh, I'm, I'm going to say my German shepherd. Yeah, she's, she's <laughs> been a, a massive positive influence in my life. So I, I think doing what I do, it's hard to stay grounded and stay present. And yeah. so having a dog forces you to be grounded and present, at, at least for a good part of your day. And there's something here that, re that relies on you. And so she, she makes my day every day. I love that. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Joe. This was so much fun. I, I'm so excited about the work that you and your company are doing. Obviously, you're making a huge difference in people's lives. You're living out your mission, and I just commend you for that. Thank you for contributing so positively to the world. Um, we're honored to be making a donation on your behalf as a thank you for your time today to the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, which is dedicated to preventing animal cruelty in the United States. So thanks for picking that organization to support. And we just wish you continued success as you work to change lives for a better world. Definitely. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay, for having me on. It was an absolute pleasure. Wonderful. And thank you also so much to our listeners for tuning in. And if you're feeling as inspired as I am right now, I'd love it if you share this episode with a colleague or two and we'll catch you next time the leading difference podcast is brought to you by valentium valentium is a contract design and manufacturing firm specializing in the development production and post-market support of diagnostic and therapeutic active medical devices including implantables and wearables for neuromodulation and other class 3 indications Valentium's core competencies include electrical design, mechanical design, embedded software, mobile apps, contract manufacturing, embedded cybersecurity, OT cybersecurity, systems engineering, human factors and usability, and automated test systems. Valentium works with clients worldwide, from startups seeking seed funding to established Fortune 100 companies. Visit valentium.com to explore your next step in medical device development.